Welcome to this session on uh, consumer protection and why the gender lens matters. Happy Consumer Rights Day. Um, we're looking forward to really uh, a dynamic session and a great discussion amongst our panelists, colleagues of mine from the United Nations Capital Development Fund, colleagues from Gabon, uh, Sierra Leone and Nigeria, all of whom will get an appropriate introduction in a moment. Um, I'd like to kick off this just very brief intro um, with some context setting for, for this session. Over the last couple decades, we've seen some really amazing progress towards financial inclusion for the most vulnerable people in the world. Since 2011, more than a billion people um, have obtained that simple financial account that could really transform their access to services and that they need on a daily basis. Most governments now have a financial inclusion strategy uh, and can deliver government payments through former financial systems. Youth, women, and many other historically marginalized groups are accessing and using products in a way that they hadn't before and on a more regular basis. In the midst of this change, however, COVID-19 has actually driven uptake of many services by virtue of that immobility and lockdowns that was really part of everyone's reality in the early days. So in fact, COVID has actually driven digitization. More people needed an account because they couldn't go anywhere and cash was no longer as simple a tool as it was previously. However, many people remain unconnected and many people remain um, outside the technological and service infrastructure that we have. So we're now really existing in almost two different worlds. Those, in one sense, COVID has accelerated digitization, and in another sense, it has actually exacerbated the digital divide. And so in the way that the pandemic has exposed the weaknesses in our economic systems and our social systems, we're seeing particularly low and middle income people losing their jobs, seeing their income and assets erode, and it's really exposed the vulnerabilities that we as a development community and committed partners of civil society, private sector and government are committed to try and adjust and adapt to and, and improve. One thing in particular we see over the horizon, we look at uh, COVID-19, for example, and the current uh, macroeconomic sociopolitical context, things like the hunger crisis, potentially inflation emerging on, on the horizon. And we're starting to ask ourselves, to what degree can our financial systems leverage digital to make sure that people are protected and can participate in a way that is meaningful in them and protect them from those vulnerabilities and create more resilience. So when we think about quality delivery of financial services for vulnerable people, it's really important that we look to conversations with everyone involved in thinking about a really participative process. And so what we're looking for today is how do we learn from our colleagues and our uh, partners in the field um, who have really many extraordinary insights about how can we ensure the system protects customers so they have the opportunity to participate in the financial system on their own terms. And in particular, when we look at the digital divide, we look at the uptake of digital services, and we look at who has the greatest potential to transform, in a sense, local, regional, and global economies, we really have to look towards women and ask ourselves the question, to what degree is our formal financial services serving the needs of women. It's much more than just inclusion itself. It's not enough to be included. It has to be useful. And so when we think about consumer protection, it's a key component and a key pillar of our safe and stable financial system. Not only is it the mandate of regulators and governments to protect and create a stable system, but it's also the responsibility of private sector institutions to be responsible and act responsibly and to protect their customers. And equally, it's the responsibilities of individuals to have that capacities to know what they need to expect certain rights and access in terms of information, redress, complaints, et cetera. And when we add a gender lens to that component, it gets fascinating. The opportunities begin to emerge and the challenges become a little bit more crystallized. So in that regard, um, I'd like to, next slide, please I believe we have an agenda. So with, in that, with that intro, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Frederic Ruman, um, who will give you a more concrete sense of the risks and opportunities associated with digital financial services and underserved groups. After which uh, our colleague, uh, Sophie Falzini, 
will really kick off the most dynamic part of this conversation, which is engaging with um, many of our three of our partners in particular from Gabon, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, who really are the meat of this uh, of this session, and to share their insights and 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 really participate in a dynamic conversation. So enough from me. Thank you all very much for participating, and please put your questions in the chat. Um, and we look forward to an open Q and A towards the end. Allow me to hand it over to Frederick. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, Sophie will present a bit more on the panel later. So that was the slide that you just saw. But yeah, so I'm very happy to have you all. And uh, as Ahmed said already, so one of our focus areas at UNCDF is basically uh, a more kind of dynamic approach to financial consumer protection, as it is our mission to support financial authorities, uh, not only to deepen their expertise, but also kind of to improve the regulatory and supervisory uh, framework for financial consumer protection. And we do this in, in different ways, uh, where we work very closely with consumers internationals uh, in terms of advocacy. Uh, we also revise uh, consumer regulation, um, consumer protection regulations, if they are existent. If they are not existent, we also help countries set them up. Uh, we work uh, on an evidence-based decision-making, uh, for instance, with CGAP very closely. Uh, we have always public consultation because especially consumers' voice is very crucial for us because it's the consumers implementing um, the frameworks in the end. And one of our core aspects is also a supervision and implementation. And at the same time, we provide uh, free scholarships and uh, capacity building, not only for policy design, but also for um, supervision. Uh, we work in about, uh, we work in 14 countries in three regions in Sub-Saharan Africa and also Middle East and North Africa. Our vision is uh, by 2030, that all governments in Africa enable a fair and financial, fair and safe, um, safe financial services and take action to protect and also empower consumers, uh, especially the most underserved groups. Next slide, please. So how does it work uh, in practice? Uh, so as I said, we focus in particular on, uh, on financial consumer protection as such. And now we have to distinguish that some countries have a, might have a consumer protection framework in place, but there might not be a, a particular link to financial consumer protection as such, and uh, in terms of uh, digital finance. So if this doesn't exist, uh, we try to work with regulators to encompass laws, uh, that encompasses laws, regulations, and institutional arrangements that safeguard all consumers in the financial market uh, place, including digital finance, of course. Um, in terms of supervision, one of our core parts is also in terms of uh, part of the market conduct uh, is to ensure effective implementation of the regulatory framework. But a precondition for all of this is, of course, that uh, first there is a policy commitment from the government uh, to work on consumer protection and really acknowledge the importance of as such, that there is an institutional mandate that there are resources and staff for regulation and also supervision in place, and that there is a regular, uh, regular and a regulator, a regulator, a regulator uh, coordination, uh, of course, also um, including civil society. Uh, next slide, please. But yeah, let's set the topic as such in, in kind of a scene to really understand the global picture of uh, why a gender lens is relevant for consumer protection. Uh, and for this, we really need to look globally. And globally, even in the 23rd century, 1 billion women globally still has no access to financial services. Um, while the number, you know, if, if you look globally of who owns a, a mobile phone in low and middle income countries, is, it seems high, 83%. Uh, in, in real figures, you know, it's still 374 million people that remain unconnected. Uh, I mean, women. So one third of the world's population is still financially illiterate, illiterate and women are disproportionately affected. Uh, but of course, we also shouldn't forget the portion of women um, kind of that works in the informal economy. If you just look in Sub-Saharan Africa, 90% uh, work in the, of women work in the informal sector. So if you don't have a financial inclusion uh, framework in place, and if you even do, 
they will not benefit from it because they work in the informal economy. So financial inclusion largely rests on a well-functioning, inclusive and transparent regulatory environment for consumer protection, because that can create trust that actually more people move to the public, to the, to the uh, formal economy. But uh, let's move to the next slide. So why are women mostly affected by consumer risk? Uh, I mentioned it before, it actually has to be uh, the consumers themselves that uh, implement it. But often there's also a lack that consumers' voices is not actually uh, taken into consideration in the policy making process or even in the policy design process. Often uh, among these 1 billion women, there's also a lack of IDs. So, and also in some countries, at least in the least developed countries, there's often an absence of a central ID registry system. And sometimes there are no alternative ID methods uh, and also in terms of risk-based customer due diligence. So they cannot simply open a bank account or even use mobile money because they don't have a digital, an ID or a digital ID. Often there's also a lack of sex disaggregated data that doesn't take into consideration uh, kind of the gender gaps or what women need. And in most countries, there's also a lack of consumer protection data. There's also a lack of complaints management mechanism to see perhaps that the most vulnerable might face discrimination or others. Uh, there's also poor safeguards of data protection. Some countries don't even have a data protection framework in place. Often this goes hand in hand with consumer protection. Uh, I mentioned it before, but there's also a lack of trust in the financial system that is kind of preventing people from moving from the informal economy to the formal economy and its respective underlying regulations that are not trusted at all. And then there's a limited uh, representation of women in the decision-making positions and limited resources for supervision. So they might be financial illiterate impacted by this, but then there might be also a lack of of skills and resources in this place of really ensuring the implementation of financial frameworks. Next slide, please. So where can, gen where can a gender lens make a difference uh, for, um, for financial consumer protection? So often um, I, we see an opportunity for also lowering um, uh, the KYC requirements for just opening uh, an account and also in relation to AML and CFT uh, regulations. We could enhance, we see a lot of potential in enhancing uh, and even build a supervision, uh, supervision for implementing FCP guidelines. Uh, we see an, an opportunity to enhance skills and deliver capacity building to cultivate more female leadership in FCP at senior levels. So for instance, uh, what we do at UNCDF is that we um, have a particular focus on giving scholarships also for female advocates in this field. Uh, and regulators, um, there's an opportunity to implement uh, national biometric ID systems. There are very good examples in Tanzania and Ethiopia, also in this field. Uh, maybe Sophie will speak more about this later in the discussion. Uh, there's also an, an, um, an opportunity to improve the understanding of women's experience of consumer-related this risk uh, so dis to, uh, through disaggregated data. And Again, CGAP has a lot of research done on like how to have more customer-centric uh, outcomes. Um, there's also a, a need to include a gender lens in financial inclusion strategies and policy guidelines. There we see a huge opportunity, not just to advocate for women empowerment, but also to, to kind of really more uh, structurally include uh, gender lens in uh, regulations and uh, policy programs. There's also an opportunity to convene and amplify consumer voices, especially the underserved. So, and this you can just do in terms of having kind of a multi-stakeholder um, engagement and including uh, women at the table. So a strong commitment to financial customer protection, consumer protection is important for a healthy, inclusive market in which women trust the financial systems. But now I spoke a lot about the theory. Let's hear, hear more about uh, how all of this works in practice. We have a lot of nice speakers on the table and I hand it over to our moderator, Sophie, to introduce the panel. 
Yes, thank you very much, Frederic, and welcome also from my side to this exciting webinar. So actually, let's move on already to our next speaker, um, Virginie Munanga. So Virginie is the CEO of Blanc Crystal, an agency based out of Gabon, specialized in digital communication and digital transformation. Through her engagement on fostering inclusivity in Gabon, she has become a figure in the digital sector of the country and also very importantly, she is a member of UNCDF CMAC panel, which aimed at accelerating the digital financial inclusion of women in Central and West Africa. So, Virginie, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So, Frederic spoke about the importance of inclusivity and especially in the digital financial space. So, first question to you would be, in your opinion, what are the needs of underserved groups uh, that are often unaddressed by existing frameworks. Okay. Hello, Sophie, and thank you for this invitation, uh, first of all. Uh, I would like to, in the beginning, uh, to talk about underserved group. Uh, we see particularly low-income people like persons with disability, women, and youth with uh, no education. So the needs of underserved group often are unaddressed that we acknowledge our financial inclusion with advanced universal access and use of financial services. Digital inclusion due to lack of finance and lack of digital training, difficult access to internet due to high price and tax of communication. If I can take an example here in Gabon, I can see that, you know, we have three types of people three types of uh, an address group, like underserved group, uh, sorry. We have women who don't trust on digital finance because of fees, because sometimes they don't know exactly what it will cost. We have also illiterate people who don't know exactly how to use financial media. And this is, you know, a barrier to use it. Also, we have the connection, you know, some of women didn't have access to connection of some rural, rural area, you know, you don't have the fluent uh, network. So this is, you know, the main ones who stop, you know, we can block the access of financial uh, digital media, uh, digital finance, uh, sorry for that. Thank you. This is, this is extremely useful and it's especially important to hear your perspective from Gabon. Yeah. Um, and perhaps a follow up question um, for you. So how do you think we can improve financial inclusion processes and consumer protection for underserved groups in Gabon? So from your perspective, what do you think can yes. we do? Of, yeah, the thing is, uh, we have to Keep on mind that underserved groups are potential consumer group who can greatly contribute to social and economic growth. So we, are, we have to take into account their needs and we might improve digital acceleration as well as financial growth at, at lots of companies. According to me, you know, approve a financial inclusion process for underserved group in Gabon. It's It's, we should prepare you know, uh, an effective way the process of digitalization and banking by bearing in mind the several and uh, the level of knowledge about the subject. We should demonstrate the high relevance of ICT in financial inclusion process and put an accent on education and training for this group. This is you know, the main recommendation we give on the UNDCF, UNDCF panel. Like We see that lots of women didn't have, you know, um, training, you know, they don't know exactly how to use it. So we have to put an accent, particular accents on education, train them and more understand. Also the, the other point, it's the communication. The lack of communication sometimes with the financial or the mobile, you know, mobile technology financing, they didn't talk more with uh, the consumer. So we have to improve, you know, both communication between women and the banker, but also a regulator, regulator would also make an effort like that. We should, we should definitely improve chain of communication. We can be aligned to Gabonese culture and strategically connect financial structure to underserved groups. So this is, you know, the main recommendation I can, I can give. It's more, you know, communication and also improve, you know, connection 
this can this is what i can say it. thank you so much I don't, know if, I don't know if you need more detail about that uh but you know this is the main point we we describe like when we have the panel no i think this is extremely valuable and i understand how valuable your experience as part of the cmac panel has been and i think we can come back and um, later to that as we have also another round of question and exactly so consumer protection has to be communicated clearly people have to be trained also customers um, and staying on this specific topic i would take the occasion to move to our next speaker and um, introduce felicia felicia monier so felicia is a professor of law at the University of Nigeria, as well as Council Member of Consumers International and Startups Organization in Nigeria. She's also board member of the International Association of Consumer Law and founder and president of Consumers Awareness Organization. She's been published several times, awarded many prizes, and she today will provide us the perspective of consumer protection in Nigeria. So looking at the gaps, the opportunities, and especially, which is interesting to us, the role of women. And so let's actually look um, at what is, does it mean to enforce a legislation. So Felicia, um, you heard Virginie before, she has highlighted the need for more communication on the benefits of consumer protection regulation. And Nigeria, as you explained us already before, has an existing consumer protection framework the central bank has become very active in promoting consumer protection legislation. But in your opinion, um, what are the challenges in enforcing the consumer protection regulation in the field of uh, digital financial services? And how can this be implemented? So over to you. Uh, Sophie, thank, thank you for this invitation. In fact, I thank the team of uh, UNCDF uh, for being, uh, for collaborating in this uh, program. Uh, just like you rightly said, Nigeria has an active uh, regulator in the financial, um, um, in the financial sector. And that regulator is the Central Bank of Nigeria. And um, um, like you also mentioned, the uh, central bank has issued many regulations. In fact, we have two basic laws in the field. We have the Central Bank uh, 2007. We also have the banks and other financial services uh, and other financial institutions uh, uh, Act 2020, which replaced the 20, uh, 1991 version. So, but all these laws, the previous laws did not um, um, uh, focus on gender, uh, inclusion or gender lens, or we can describe the, uh, the old laws as um, being gender neutral, gender neutral, or maybe, maybe just supporting gen gender equality, just like other uh, characteristics, uh, race, religion, and others. So no special um, program for women, but uh, um, from the, uh, maybe from 2016, that's under the um, uh, consumer protection uh, framework, we started seeing a little different, just a little, because the framework um, uh, just mentions gender equality and special services, special services, but not tailored or not, uh, not, not, not focused on a particular, on a particular um, gender, but then, banks, some banks have been using that to give special incentives to women. So that didn't change um, um, things much, but later, in fact, the latest framework we have now, or the latest guideline, that is the framework for advancing uh, women's financial inclusion. So this is specific on women, and it has specific uh, uh, provisions on how to enhance the participation of women in financial uh, in the financial sector so this so i can say that we are beginning to uh, experience a positive change from neutral from gender neutrality to gender uh, to women centered 
initiatives. So we are hoping that in terms of implementation, that the right results will be uh, uh, will be uh, realized. But then, when you talk about the challenges, the challenges are still there. Um, some of them are general, you know. Some of them affect both uh, male and female uh, customers or populations of the country. We you have lack of education as one of the challenges. You have lack of uh, income or lack of education, then lack of trust, which you even mentioned in your own presentation. So, and when, and with particular uh, reference to women, you also have marital status. So women who marry very early do not have time to, um, to uh, build their skin, skills, and that's also a problem. Then on a general note, location is a problem, still a problem in Nigeria. Those located in the rural areas do not uh, enjoy as much financial access as those in the urban areas. The internet service is a, a, also a problem in the rural areas. Many uh, people do not enjoy internet service. And added to this, you also have uh, inability to purchase uh, the devices needed for digital financial services, phones, uh, computers and the, the like. And even when you have the, some of them have the, the ability, you also talk about the literacy, financial literacy. How many people can operate this, especially women in the rural areas? So these are some of the things, even though the, the central bank uh, is um, pursuing maybe financial inclusion and the latest uh, program rolled out by the bank is to the fact that by 2024, that Nigeria should have about 95% uh, inclusion of both male and females. But talking specifically about we, we are the female gender, right now the gap is even becoming wider. Why is this so? In fact, the, the financial exclusion of women in Nigeria right now is 46, about 46.5. That is the basic the research that is available now. And when you talk about women, women are special, uh, special people in the sense that many of them are, are cautious of their money. I mean, I mean, I know that women are also cautious of their money, but a woman doesn't want to lose her resources because her family, everything about her, everything about her re re revolves on her own resources. The woman will want to train her children, even when the husband has um, the means to do so. She takes particular attention. She takes particular interest in all those things. So she wants to uh, invest well uh, and earn good profit. And you see, when we talk about financial inclusion, there's something I always say. You don't just talk about, and um, Ahmed mentioned part of it. You don't just talk about inclusion. You must also talk about usefulness. If I'm included, what do I have to gain? You must talk about incentives. And that is the missing point. That is the missing point in many countries, including Nigeria. Nigeria now, what is the interest rate? Because if I want to save my money, I also want to make money. I don't just want to dump my money in the bank. At the end of the month, how much interest do I have? Savings rate is about 2% per annum. 2% per annum. So if I invest, um, I'm using a different currency, 100,000. Um, I put my 100,000 in the bank and end of the month, I get one, one, well, 100, um, about 150 or 160. You may not understand this when you, but when you convert it, just nothing. So what's the incentive to put my money there? So there is not just inclusion in the sense that we must all have accounts. If you are preaching inclusion, you must preach benefits. What are the benefits of financial inclusion? What are the benefits of digital financial inclusion? I must, and okay, when you now talk about digital financial inclusion, if I use my ATM, uh, ATM card to withdraw money, what do I gain? What do I lose? Nigeria, well, Nigeria has done a little there because before the, the rate was 65 Naira. If you withdraw from another bank using your ATM, it was 65 Naira. But now it has been reduced. The central bank has reduced it to 35 Naira after the fourth withdrawal. So that's an incentive. And if you withdraw from your own bank, using your ATM, 
you don't pay anything irrespective of number. So those are the things we want to hear from the financial um, uh, regulators. So um, is it, you, in fact, I, I, should, finish, yeah. I think you just made a perfect segue for our next speaker. I think two points you made are extremely relevant, right? So we don't only talk about inclusion, we talk about the usefulness of what we do. And also, I think we have to understand financial behaviors of women in order to target their needs. So in order for financial inclusion to be useful, we really need to understand what is the challenge? What is the problem? Um, and actually, thank you very much for that, because now, Philippe, you have um, an, a um, challenging task before you. So our next speaker is Philippe Bangura. He's assistant director of the Consumer Protection and Credit Reference Bureau at the Bank of Sierra Leone. Um, through his work, he has contributed greatly towards addressing the issues of financial inclusion. Uh, Philippe, we are very excited to have you here. Um, given that you bring to our discussion your insights from a new point of view, which is the one of a regulator. Um, so you just have heard from Felicia that also having a regulation is not enough, that uh, if there's no clear implementation strategy, this wouldn't work. So perhaps I would like to ask you, what were the challenges in implementing financial consumer protection guidelines in Sierra Leone? Um, over to you and thank you again. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for having me. Um, the big challenge we had was banks don't want to take um, that responsibility, you know, knowing that the central bank is watching and enforcing us, as Felicia said, banks don't want that. So we had some few challenges with them initially. Well, because what we've been doing as a central bank, we have been addressing customers' complaints, which should not be our goal. Our goal is to enforce that from the financial services providers. They're supposed to address complaints. But we've been taking that leading role because um, they were not available. And so far, with the support of UNCDF, we were able to um, look at guidelines from other jurisdictions, most especially within the subregion, Nigeria, Ghana, and so on, to be able to see what they're doing to protect consumers and see what we can do because we share similarities in culture. So we, we looked at that and we were able to come up with a document that, we were, uh, that we've um, finalized now. Well, the key challenges had to be with um, financial institution not wanting to take responsibility and, and consumers not understanding their rights and responsibilities. So those were some other things we've done with that part. This is great. Thank you very much. And perhaps um, building up on that and, and give you that our session um, explicitly focus on the most underserved um, and women, so can you perhaps elaborate a bit more on the consultation process for your draft um, consumer protection guidelines and why was it important in your point of view to include women and you know, where, which were the challenges you faced maybe during this process? Okay, um, with the consultation process, we consulted the banks and we consulted um, the consumers, market women, um, teachers, students, and we had a discussion with them. And our, during our discussion, we learned a lot because there have been a lot of challenge between the banks and the consumers as to areas that we've included in the guidelines that they did not like. For the banks, they were not happy with the cooling off because we included a cooling off period of 10 days where customers can take a loan. And then after 10 days, if they don't feel comfortable with the loan, they can return it without any penalty. The banks were saying that is, is too long because the customers who want short-term loan will exploit that, take the loan, and then after 10 days, return the loan without paying any interest, neither penalty. And But we were looking at a situation where we need to give the customers an opportunity. The customers, obviously, when we consulted with them, they were excited. They loved that. But at the end of the day, we reduce it to five days instead of 10. And what we've done is we've asked the banks to record the names of all those who utilize the cooling off period. And that information should be sent to the central bank to avoid abuse of the system. So those who realize are in the habit of taking loans, 
And after, because they have a cool enough period, they return the loan. If we note that a particular individual is in the habit of doing that, we will obviously shut them down from the system because we want to ensure that that particular facility is meant for those benefiting and those who really need it. Another issue that came up with the um, consumers were the issue of debt collection. They complained that banks are using aggressive methods to collect debt. They will go and meet them in the marketplaces and are very aggressive with them and everybody will know that this is what's going on. So they want us to see how we can control that. So within the guidelines, we've identified steps you have to take before um, and which do not include this aggressive behavior. This behavior, we've asked the consumers to report that. And we agree that they can contact the consumers um, every day within a particular period. But that was also another issue the banks were not happy with. They wanted an open timeline because it says some of the consumers leave their home very early and go there very late. So they want to be sure that they meet them there. So that was also another issue that we, we address. And another one has to deal with the, um, the women being discriminated against. Well, what we did in a, uh, in a bit of urgency, we issued a, a directive with regards to access to credit for women that women should not be discriminated against. But and up to now, we haven't received any complaint as to whether women are discriminated. But we realized that if we wait for them to come and complain, we will never get the complaint. So what we've instituted now, that probably will start getting the data later, is now we want all financial services provider to send us the list of all those who applied for loan and all those who are approved um, on the gender. So we are able to see, and the reason why the, the, those who are declined, why they were declined. So we are able to see the proportion of women applying and actually accessing loan. And then the proportion of men applying and accessing loan. And the reason why some of these loans are not approved. So we are able to understand whether discrimination exist because for now if they don't come and complain you don't have any way of knowing that but if we are able to get this data that we've never collected before that could help us address that issue i think that's where i can stop for now i don't know thank you very much i think um you made you made a very important point um and i think we can summarize it with we need to improve communication among all stakeholders from customers to the central bank so this is important to make sure that trust is built within the financial, um, the formal financial system and that discriminations do not take place. But then also another relevant thing you touched upon, which actually goes back to Frederick's presentation before it, we need data, we need more sexist aggregated data to really understand what's going on, what's the problem, where the challenge lies in order to act upon that. So I think, um, this is very in line with our approach and not only ours. And I'm, I'm very glad you brought those, those topics um, up. Um, so perhaps um, I see there have, been, there, have no, uh, there have been no further questions from the audience yet. So perhaps let me ask you um, a final round of questions to all of the speakers. And this will be the same question for everybody. So feel free to interpret it um, as you prefer. And then um, perhaps keep your um, messaging a bit shorter than before so that we can allow for the audience to ask questions. So Felicia, I might start with you and then we'll do the round. Um, I would like to ask you, how can development partners um, and local advocates help consumer protection authorities drive policy change? for financial consumer protection, especially with a very strong gender lens. Okay, Sophie, very, um, I'm very happy that you asked this question because I was also going to make the, that comment based on the summary you gave and uh, the presentation, the last aspect of uh, Philip's uh, presentation on data, the importance of data evidence-based um, uh, approach to issues because it's not just enough to say that uh, uh, in Nigeria, many women are not financially included, or in Gabon, many women are not financially included. You must have um, data produced from, from a survey. And 
um, your question as regards the role of um, uh, of uh, of um, uh, sponsors or donor agencies like uh, USCDF. When you yes, I think it was during the briefing that I raised this. See, uh, it's very good when uh, donor agencies support the regulators, regulators to produce a sound financial system, for instance, because any, uh, any, uh, at the outcome of any sort project, uh, still benefits consumers. In other words, consumers are the ultimate beneficiaries of whatever uh, support is given to uh, the regulators. But then, we, we must also look at the consumer groups because these people are independent in nature and they interrogate from a different perspective. I, when I listened to Philip, I was impressed with what the, um, the, the consumer uh, groups did regarding the cooling period, regarding the aggressive method of recovering no. So regulators will not see from that angle. Of course, uh, service providers will not see from angle that angle. And when you leave implementation, uh, as in, as, uh, uh, maybe if, if, if you leave just the regulators to regulate and implement, there's a problem, there's a gap. That means that everything about, the, about consumer protection will, will remain in the domain of the regulators and service providers. And so how they belong to the same group, that's how we see them. So there must be an independent voice and the independent voice must be provided by consumer groups. So it's important when donor agencies are assisting in any field at all, including the financial inclusion and digital and financial inclusion, then, Civil society organizations must come in. Voluntary consumer associations must come in. Because when they come in, in the first place, they see consumers from a different angle. They understand the concerns of consumers. They know the challenges that consumers have. So when they are participating, they'll be able to bring the consumer angle into uh, the decision-making process. And when the consumer angle is included in the, in the decision-making process, implementation problem will be reduced because at that stage of uh, decision-making, most of the thorny issues would have, been, would have been resolved through cross fertilization of ideas, through constructive criticisms and others. So sponsorship must uh, extend to consumer groups and of course must extend to the regulators, because I always say that consumer groups must collaborate with the uh, with the regulators. Reason being that when it comes to um, enforcement and implementation, that the regulators have the machinery to carry out effective uh, enforcement. But consumers play a very uh, consumer groups play a very important role because they will be the ones to explain the system to consumers, to to explain the benefits and the detriments. If there are risks associated with that process, they will be in a better position to explain to consumers in an objective manner. So consumers must be empowered because if you don't have the, the empowerment, you can't even do an effective lobbying, you can't do an effective enforcement, you cannot cons okay, advise consumers uh, appropriately. So we need all these things. So any, any sponsorship that is restricted to, to regulators will not work. But if regulators are supported, consumer groups are supported, so that consumer groups will be empowered, they will have the ability to influence the process and even to drive the process. That Indeed. Thank you very much. And I think that's an excellent point, which will take home as well. Um, and actually, this is part of the approach we're trying to follow. We want to talk to both regulators to both consumers association and to make the happy middle, right? To make sure that both stakeholders talk to each other and that um, we can actually base our action on, you know, that our action are um, fact-based, right? So that we bring the real issues to the regulators. And perhaps speaking of um, regulators, Philip, um, might I ask you the same questions? Like, um, 
maybe just for, um, for you, how can development partners and local advocates help consumer protection authorities drive policy change for financial consumer protection while embedding a gender lens? Uh, thank you very much. I think for us, we've been blessed to be supported by UNCDF in developing our guidelines. So we we'll just encourage UNCDF and other developing partners that have supported us to continue to support us, especially with on-site and off-site supervision. We we'll still need some skills. Financial consumer protection is still new to us. And also we possibly um, a database to help us remotely monitor complaints real time because that's very important. For local advocates, they need to help us with sensitization and financial education. So they need to work with the central bank to ensure we educate a lot of people and they know that this law is there and it protects them and also has to do with because that's one key issue we included in our guidelines that every financial contract should be read in the language that the consumer understands so and then the consumer should thumbprint if they cannot sign every page of that contract to ascertain they understand the document Sometimes when they need the loan, they can just dump print without even understanding the document. So we expect this local advocate, these groups, to ensure they tell these consumers and ensure that they, this um, part of it is also enforced. We can help as a central bank, but we have our limitation. Our local advocates, local partners within those champion, uh, championing consumer rights can help us with that. So that is how I think we can move. And with regards to the gender, what we've, we've given out as a directive, we will try to include those in our, this is just the guidelines, we have to do an act. So with, with our lessons learned and we are able to see from real time data how women are being discriminated against, we will be able to include that in the law that will be passed in parliament in the near future. So for us, this is what we would do and what we need. Thank you. This is great. Um, and actually speaking of local advocates, I think, um, I can't but give the word to Virginie. And as we said before, Virginie was a very, very important member of the UNCDF CMAC panel, um, which maybe Virginie, if you want, you can say a couple of words about the panel, what you did, what you did during the panel. Um, and so um, the panel actually brought together advocates, mainly women from the CMAC region, and they um, uh, created joint recommendations um, and our report on this recommendation will come out soon. So we hope um, uh, to be able to share with you very soon. But Virginie, she was part of the whole process. She knew how difficult it is to bring the voice of the consumers to the mm -hmm. forefront. So do you wanna say a couple of words about that um, and um, wrap up our discussion? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, just that I, I agree, I fully agree with Felicia's point of view and also um, my brother in the regulation, because, you know, it, it's very important to create this group of composed of consumer, you know, to have a voice when regulators take some decision. We have here in Gabon uh, a concern, sometimes when the regulator take a decision, you know, uh, the consumer just take it like that, you know, we, we are not informed, we don't know exactly why they, they take this decision. And, you know, it's something very difficult. I think that oh, we have to very improve the communication. And I agree with uh, what they said. And this is one of the main recommendations we have. Also training and also improve, you know, the services. Like we have to find, you know, the words more appropriate for the underserved groups, you know, because sometimes the financial world is so complicated, but you have to find, you know, the way to explain to them and to, you know, it will be easier, you know, to improve uh, inclusion, digital inclusion for women. So this is what I, I can say, but thank you so much because uh, it was great to have, uh, you know, all this discussion and uh, we will put it, I will put it uh, also in the recommendation we have on the panel. Thank you very much, Virginie. And perhaps to add a very important part of the recommendation of the CMAC panel was the importance of um, consumer protection. Um, and so this is something, and especially the voice of women, and um, we thought this was a great opportunity actually for women to express their needs. And given that they come, they came from different regions, from different countries, this is even more special because each country has different needs. 
um, and this has to be have to be portrayed. Um, so, dear attendees, speakers, this session has been very very enriching. Um, I see people are still thinking about which questions to ask. So in the meantime, um, maybe for the sake of understanding, I'll just um, make a very small summary of everything we heard. This, is, this won't uh, give justice to all of your comments, but I hope um, maybe it will help us summarize a bit uh, the discussion. So, um, so from Virginie, we heard that we do not have to forget the underserved. The underserved groups are potential consumers um, who can contribute to social and economic growth, right, mm -hmm. to um, improve the financial inclusion process for the underserved. Accents should be put on digitization. And as you said before, and you're an advocate for that, Virginie, digital literacy and especially better communication have to be present and we have to invest more resources on that. Um, and then Felicia, um, she highlighted how important consumer protection regulations are, but that they have to specifically target women, their needs and consumers. Um, of course, regulations are important, but they have to be followed by clear implementation plans, which serve a specific purpose. And I think what you said before, Felicia, is extremely relevant on you know, donors must talk to regulators, but also to consumers and civil society organizations have to come in to close the gap. And and third, Philip, I think you made a strong point before on sex aggregated data, which we as UNCDF share very much. And in order to understand the size of the gender gap, uh, build strategies around that, and then also highlighting the challenges um, faced by regulators, which of course is something we need to take into account well when we, when we cooperate um, with them. Um, I just saw um, a question coming in. Um, so how can policymakers raise awareness around consumer protection and ensure that consumers are, are aware of their rights? Is anybody from the panel wanted to um, take this? Uh, question maybe in one um, minute and um, if not perhaps a sub question could be what do you see as biggest opportunity for 2022? I don't know Philip do you want to get us started in like one two minute response? Come, on, come again with the question please. So perhaps um, the first question would be, how do you think policymakers can raise awareness around consumer protection or make sure that consumers are aware of their rights? Because you, you said before, right? So um, financial literacy is important, but is there anything else we can do from your regulatory perspective? Well, for us, um, apart from the financial education that we've been doing, we have to do a lot of sensitization local go to the different local um, chieftaincy, local region, and talk to the people there because we need to let them understand. It's all part of this financial inclusion drive because some of them are yet to join the financial system because they don't have confidence based on what they hear. So we need to have groups of consumers who have made complaints and have been successfully, um, issues been successfully addressed, use them as case study in some of these community. So they tell you, I had this experience and I made a report and within three days it was resolved. So when they see this real situation in their community, it gives them more confidence to use the system. And we have that peer group. So we identify champions in all of this town that we use, we work with as a central bank to educate them and pass on this message. So that is how we intend to disseminate the information further, rather than just using TV and radio adverts. This, this, is, this is very relevant. And I think um, I actually saw a pretty nice question coming in, which um, I think it's, uh, I'd, I'd like um, perhaps Felicia, Felicia to take a stab at it. So um, what do you think, uh, what do you see as biggest opportunity for 2022? Like when you think at 2022, what is the, you know, uh, best thing would have happened? Um, maybe just, yeah, unmute, unmute on that. Okay, thank you. The biggest opportunity I can think of is financial literacy. Financial literacy, um, that, that's um, enlightenment campaign 
on financial uh, literacy, on how on, on financial inclusion based on or driven by financial literacy. You cannot go into um, financial uh, digital financial services if you do not have the literacy to do that, the ability to do that. And there are two stages when you talk about digital financial uh, services. The first is financial inclusion. You must be financially included before you, before you migrate to digital financial services. So, but then how do you even become financially included? You must have the means to, be, to do that. So we must also uh, emphasize on job creation. Activities that give income to people, including women. We must emphasize women because in Nigeria, for instance, we have a population of about 200 million people. That's a very huge number, 200 million people. And out of this number, about 49, 49% of Nigerians are women, 49. So a very large number to almost 100 million. So you can't afford to, uh, to ignore this uh, group of people. So you must give financial, to, to achieve financial inclusion, you must give financial or economic power to women. So uh, revenue generating events must be uh, initiated for women. That's my take on that. This, this is great. And actually, um, I saw that while you were speaking about financial literacy, Virginie was just shaking her head. So I guess she was, <laughs> That's for sure. yeah, she shared your opinion yeah. as well. Virginie, do you want to add anything? On that, so I, I guess, think. This is, I think. Yeah. We, Go ahead. Yeah, I think we should also, you know, increase trustworthy of, uh, you know, all the framework on uh, financial inclusion and all the decision. You know, this is also very important because you know, lots of women didn't trust, you know, the bank and didn't trust, you know, to use digital media, you know, to do payments everything, you know. So it's very important that we we take we took good decision and reinsure you know women on using digital digital uh, banking for everything yeah and actually thank you very much for that because i think if i would summarize this whole session with one word would be the importance of building trust building trust uh, within the consumer groups with the regulators among each other with donors um, and I think, you know, throughout this session, we managed to do that, um, both highlighting the challenges and the opportunities. And I see we are very close to the end of um, our, our webinar. And I think on behalf of my entire team, um, Ahmed, uh, Mariana, all those in the back scene, Frederic, we would like to thank you very much for your presence. Um, your engagement, for contributing to the discussion especially. Uh, we'd like to thank most of all Consumers International for having hosted us um, and for highlighting once again that consumer protection and gender have to be on the forefront of our agenda and continue have to continue to be on the forefront of our agenda. Um, so if you're still not annoyed by us and want to watch the session again and again, um, I believe that the recording should be made public um, on the website on Consumers International. And also, um, given that those days are packed with presentations and webinars, we do invite you to join um, another key session, which will take place tomorrow, March uh, 16 where Consumers International and our members will launch a consumer statement on buy now, pay later. And uh, this will outline consumer risks uh, associated with such products and call for six recommendations to strengthen and, and regulate such products. And also, if you're very interested in knowing more about how to mitigate consumer risks, especially for, for the most underserved um, and women and mostly, and do uh, join CGAP session tomorrow as they will present their new research and blog on consumer risks. So I think we're just good in time. So thank you so very much for um, attending and um, yeah, have a good day. Thanks everyone, take care. Thank you.